Hello and thanks for joining us. I'm Elizabeth Glinker and you're watching Sunday Politics London. Good morning and welcome to the show. Coming up, there's been a 50% increase in the number of older people not getting the support they need. Is social care in the capital close to breaking down? And from one crisis to another, doctors in London are warning there's a chronic shortage of GPs and if nothing's done, it'll break the NHS as we know it. Well, joining me for the duration of the show today is Theresa Villiers, the Conservative MP for Chipping Barnet, and Neil Coyle, the Labour MP for Bermondsey and Old Southwark. Welcome to both of you. Now, we're going to be talking a lot today about health and social care. But first, let's start with the only London MP standing in the Conservative leadership contest, Boris Johnson, who officially launched his campaign this week. And so now is the time to unite this country and unite this society. And we cannot begin that task until we have delivered on the primary request of the people the big thing that they asked us to do. After three years and two missed deadlines, we must leave the EU on October the 31st. <laughs> Well, of course, Boris Johnson won the first ballot held on Thursday with 114 votes. Uh, and one of them, of course, Theresa, was yours. Why does he have your vote? Uh, because when he was mayor of London, he led from the centre ground and he had a strong track record of delivering on things like crime and improving the transport system. Crime Did he came down by 20%. Did he have a those sorts of things? Uh, and the murder rate came down he by promised 50%. A thousand, he promised a thousand new police officers, which he didn't deliver. He overspent on projects like the Garden Bridge. Uh, he um, presided over a massive increase in rough sleeping in the city, having said he was going to eradicate it. What is it about uh, this man that you think makes him a, a good candidate for Prime Minister? Because he cut crime by 20%. He cut the murder rate by 50% and taxes also came down by 20% and he demonstrated that he was able to put on the 2012 Olympics one of the most successful events ever staged I, in it this would country. Be, I mean he may have had a little bit of help on that perhaps from Sebco and Tessa Jowell he you know perhaps didn't do that single-handedly. Well well let's add on the transport system becoming much more reliable with tube delays coming down by a third and substantial investment in the London Underground after it was stalled for Did years under Ken Livingstone. Um, he he is, is, is an someone element. who has demonstrated that he can provide effective leadership for the greatest city in the world. I think that equips him to be a good Prime Minister for this country. Does it? Because we often hear, it is often said, that really a lot of the work that was done in, by that administration was actually done by the people around Boris Johnson, not the man himself. Is he really capable of office at that high level at a period in time when this country is going through arguably its you know, greatest period of crisis since the Second World War? Is he really capable of that level of, of handling that level of detail and complexity. Yes, I believe he is. And one of the, the qualities of a good leader is, is gathering good people around him. And he demonstrated that he was capable. He did have that quality as the Mayor of London. And I'm sure that is something that he will also bring to number 10 if he becomes Prime Minister, to have good people and to delegate to them at this hugely important time. I, one of the reasons I'm backing him is because I think he's the person capable of defeating Jeremy Corbyn because I believe that a Jeremy Corbyn government would be disastrous for my constituents in Barnet, absolutely disastrous and that's why I'm backing the candidate who I think is most likely to beat Corbyn. But he, he wasn't massively successful as for secretary and you look at um, some of the things he handled during that period, you look at his behaviour, his language, referring to uh, members of the Commonwealth as flag-waving piccaninnies, um, to well, referring that, to, uh, that, that kind to of Muslim women life. who wear the veil as looking like letterboxes. This isn't very prime ministerial, is it? Well, the, the, the language about flag-waving is was obviously 
not language I would use, um, and I don't think it was. Ex I don't think language. it was acceptable in the past. The the reference to the burqa was actually in the context of an article where Boris was defending the right of people to wear what they want in the light of uh, but not very, to ban it But not very clear the messaging world. then, and certainly something that might be of concern if that person was then the Prime Minister. But again, look at his record as mayor. Boris showed you know, huge enthusiasm for engagement with all of London's diverse communities. He's demonstrated his, his he commitment might to, engage, to cultural diversity. He might very good at defending them as well. Actually, you know, as as a writer, writers of uh, you know tend to sometimes to use provocative language. And as I've said, there are some things that Boris have said in the past which, which I I would not support. I wouldn't use those words myself. But actually, th the real contrast here again, you know, Boris compared to Jeremy Corbyn. Jeremy Corbyn is the man who's overseeing well, a serious anti-Semitism problem. Yeah. The party is being investigated by the Human Rights Neil Commission. Coyle, That's much does, more important does than Theresa have, words. Theresa Villiers have a point here in that you look at what is going on on the other side of the house and you mm. guys should be capitalising on this and cutting through Oops. and it seems that you're more preoccupied with arguments around uh, anti-Semitism within the party uh, or Brexit itself because there is arguably still not a clear position coming from your front bench. I think it, what I would accept completely openly is that the Labour Party should be in a much, much stronger position, especially against a government that I think has been very damaging for London, very damaging for Southwark and my, and my constituents in particular. We should be in a stronger position. But the idea that Boris is the answer and that revisionism about his role as mayor when he you know, promised to uh, cut rough sleeping and it more than doubled, actually we saw violent crime continue to rise when he was there and cuts to the police service that shouldn't have come through. So you know, and, and the, the narrative of the team Boris now is that he needs other people around him to do the job he's been given but also because they don't trust him to do the job on his own. And yes, I wish we were in a stronger position. And yes, actually, I don't think we should be tolerating anyone with anti-Semitic views in our party. There should be much, much more action and swift reaction to throw them out. But the idea that this is uh, you know, in any way a comparison to what Boris could do as a damaging leader for this country, and what he has been saying is that he would take us out of Europe with no deal at all. And I know some people support that because the Tory party has been taken over by a suicide cult in effect. I think we're seeing the Tory party reach the end of but its some, political But some life. would argue that your front bench hasn't made it, <clears throat> hasn't really made it clear that, that, you know, when push comes to shove, that they would actually stop that from happening. I think we'll find the, the mechanisms to make that happen. And, and personally, you know, I've had my differences with the front bench on, on Europe. I support revoking Article 50. I didn't vote to trigger Article 50. I rebelled on that vote. And I think any sense incoming Prime Minister would do that rather than risk the damage to our economy, uh, to people's opportunities and even on things like, I mean, I know Theresa supports the WTO rules, it doesn't even cover electricity exchange on the financial, uh, international financial market. So unless we can suddenly build a nuclear reactor and provide uh, autonomous uh, energy supply, we could face real and, 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 and life-threatening damage to our country. And that, this is being okay. sponsored by Boris. All right. It's, well, OK, we are, we are going to sort of stay a little bit with the leadership contest now. Now, um, do you at home have any questions for the man who will become Prime Minister? We know now, one thing we do know is that it is going to be a man. Um, on Tuesday the 18th of June, BBC One will be hosting a live election hostings between the candidates for the Conservative leadership. Their debate will be shaped by your questions and what we're asking you to do is submit them in advance. You can email haveyoursay at bbc.co.uk with your questions and include your name and contact number if you're interested in actually asking those questions on the night and we do now know that in fact Boris Johnson is going to be taking part uh, in those hustings uh, right okay uh, so we're gonna put the spotlight back on you guys now and ask you for that one issue away from some of that big picture stuff um, one issue that you're kind of working on in, perhaps in the constituency that's very important to you, Neil? Well, the issue, I, I'm trying to seek an amendment to the domestic abuse bill that's going through, uh, in this government are bringing forward now, because we know that the, there is an overlap between people becoming homeless, particularly women becoming homeless, and domestic abuse. About 20% of the women crisis support who are homeless is a direct result of homelessness. Um, the government has claimed that the Homeless Reduction Act, which was uh, sponsored by my Southern colleague Helen Hayes, um, would, would change some of this, and actually what we've seen is 
these councils, because of their resource issues, because of the budget issues, they are screening and not providing long-term safe homes for many of the women in particular. So affected. there's there's provision in, I, I suppose, in in the immediate aftermath of a woman right. leaving home to and, look and, for and safety. And she can get into a refuge, but you're saying yeah. it's actually the longer-term picture. So refuges and hostels are incredibly important as an immediate first step to longer-term stability in a safe home, but actually what, what is being denied is that long-term safe home. And if people want to join the support crisis are hosting this and we launched our report which has uh, the evidence on 2,000 people in this, these exact circumstances since the implementation of the Homeless Reduction Act. So it's something I would hope has cross-party support, something there is a window of opportunity through this bill to try and make right for those people who flee in domestic violence uh, control and, 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 and abuse and, and actually ended up homeless as a result through no fault of their own. That just shouldn't be happening in our country. Theresa, is this something you would support? Well, I, I think it would be great to have the debate. I obviously very much support the ambition to ensure that uh, victims of domestic abuse get the housing they need. Um, I know there are already provisions you know, within the rules to provide for that, but if we need to strengthen them, then you know, obviously seriously consider whether we need that amendment. It's the guaranteed priority allocation of long-term support that's needed, not not just the emergency support. That's the difference that needs. Uh, and that's the crucial. Defined. That's it's the crucial amendment. thing. Yeah. Okay. So, Theresa, what is the issue that you would like to talk about? Well, I've been campaigning for for a long time to save Barnet Police Station, like a number of police stations around the, around London. Um, the Mayor and the Met took the decision to close the front desk to the public um, at the end of 2017, but the police station itself has continued in use by officers and I was delighted that it's recently had a reprieve, so it'll stay in police hands rather than being sold off um, until at least August 2020. And just this week I received even better news that um, uh, for a temporary period, the front desk will be reopening. Right. Um, and, th and this is partly driven by a decant from another police station. So it is only temporary, but it's a demonstration that the option is still there to save Barnet Police Station. If, if the mayor and the Metropolitan Police uh, are prepared to listen to the community because they, they value it, a yes, police I mean, station is, being there. Is it something that constituents really do value? Because, of course, we know police uh, funding is stretched as are many other areas of, of public finance and that there you know there are limited resources and it, you know the Met has had to make decisions about where they put that money um, it, it are having police stations where the public can walk in is that really the pol policing of the future is that preferable to having police out patrolling in different parts of London I mean if choices have to be made well, I mean, you make a fair point. There, there, the the Met and and the Mayor have had to make some difficult decisions to ensure that, you know, taxpayers' money is spent as effectively as possible. But and it is also true that the way people report crimes is changing. So the use of front desks is not as great as it once was. But I think the value of having a police station is huge to my constituents and. I, my fear is if the police station closes down altogether and there are no officers there, that would see even more of a retreat by officers. They become even less visible I, if our only police station is several miles away in Collinder. We're going to have to leave it there, but I kind of know what the Met would say if they were here. Still, never mind. We're, we're moving on. Um, but first, we have a little bit of housekeeping to do. Um, last week, the Conservative MP Stephen Hammond mentioned a candidate standing in the by-election for the Cannon Hill Ward in the London Borough of Merton, which is coming up on Thursday. And as I told you at the time, there are other candidates. There are five in total. The other four are appearing on your screens now. They are Ryan Barnett, Jennifer Gould, Andrew Mills and Susie O'Connor. Details can be found, full details can be found on the Merton Council website. So there you have it, that's your public information uh, there. Right, we're on to our main discussion now and with council budgets under pressure, new figures reveal there's been a 50% increase in the number of older people not getting the support they need in London. Nearly one in eight will struggle to live independently. Jessica Yor has this. Demand is rising, with London's population expected to include an estimated half a million more people aged over 65 in the next 15 years. Social care for adults and vulnerable young people takes on average up to 58% of council budgets. In London, that ranges from 67% of total spending in Brent to 54% in Islington. London relies on social care workers from continental Europe. 
In Hammersmith and Fulham, nearly a third of staff are EU or European Economic Area citizens, whilst in Barnet and Kingston, it's one in four. Across the city, the average is 14%, far higher than in other regions. Many of these staff will want to apply for settled status. All of this in a system already bearing a 10% vacancy rate. So, is a new approach needed? Well, that report was based on the findings of Dr. Onka Sahota, a practicing GP, a Labour London member, <coughs> Labour member of the London Assembly, and also uh, the chair of the Assembly Health Committee, and he joins us now. Um, so, I have heard that you say that lives are actually being lost because of problems with social care. Well, it, it's, it, it's, it's not a big thing to <coughs> imagine because when you have... A, social care services collapsing, people can't get the care that they need in the home, they will have injuries, they can fall down or they aren't being felt nutritiously, so they will end up deaths and of course this is happening in the, in the NHS now. And what's your personal experience, personal experience of this? We heard you know you are a GP in London as well as uh, the other, other job, important jobs that you have. Yes. What's your personal experience of this on the ground? Well on the ground I know that patients can uh, have difficulty getting social care that, that they deserve, that the system is overstretched, that they can't uh, uh, get the care which keeps them in the community and of course these patients then end up in hospital and once they get well they can't be discharged into the community so the hospital system is now under, uh, under pressure because they can't discharge patients early on and that, and that will be is, is, is obvious to every person who, who's involved with the NHS. We know there, is, uh, there has been pressure on local authorities uh, spending in this area. We know that a lot of the people doing these care jobs are actually being paid the minimum wage or maybe just a little more. Um, what would you like to see change? Well, of course, the first thing is that the healthcare system and social system isn't well funded. We are underfunding in compared to Europe. Europe is spending something like 10 to 11 percent of the GDP on on healthcare services, whilst we're not. Uh, we also know uh, that uh, 58 percent of the budget of the local authorities is spent on social care, and there has been a, a reduction of of a huge amount in the in the social care budget of the local, local authorities. I mean, does it, is it just that then? Is it, it does it really come down to funding? Well, I think the basic thing is that we don't fund our social care in NHS sufficiently, uh, certainly not in, in comparison to the European countries. And, and it's also more expensive in London than in other parts of the country. Absolutely. The living wage in London should be £10 an hour, uh, whilst the average salary of a healthcare worker, social care worker in London is about £8.60. So we aren't paying those people enough. And, and something like 50% um, of our social care workers are working in the uh, as zero hour contracts. So I think we, we're, not, we're not looking after our people very well. I mean, that is, I mean, that's really disturbing, isn't it, Theresa, to hear uh, that we, we are at a point where social care is so poor that some older people are falling through the gaps and perhaps dying earlier than they would be if they were cared for properly. Well, obviously, that, that would be deeply worrying. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure I, I necessarily accept all the figures, but what I would acknowledge is that um, it is a system under pressure. Um, I mean, the government's put in a sort of approximately 10 billion over over recent years, including the council tax precept, to, to relieve that pressure. But, but there is no doubt enough, that we, it? we, we do not enough. We do need resilience and the sort of longer term solution that Dr. Sahota talked about in his article. And that means we do need to get that green paper out, I'm afraid. We yeah. need to, to have a longer term and solution. And it's all very well flagging government. up the precept, but when London councils like Southwark are losing another 8 million central government funding, it really shouldn't be a surprise that if, if you as a government uh, take away half of a council's budget, half the people who apply for social care no longer receive it. And that is, that is what is happening. And you vote for these budgets and then say it's not linked to that. Same as you did with the police station. You voted for the police cuts and then you campaigned to keep a local police station over. There's a, there's a responsibility gap here. I, I've actually been back in the National Care Service since I worked for the National Centre for Independent Living more than 10 years ago. And fundamentally, that's the system we need to move to, funded through general taxation. This government is in paralysis. Their social mm. care bill should have been produced two years ago. And this government has been so paralysed by Brexit Absolutely. that they've ignored that. And what we've seen from, from the Lord Chancellor, was Chancellor Checker rather, is payment, right, on an a, 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 on a, on, on a interim basis, right, rather than long-term planning. What the NHS is is, is sustainability, long-term funding and long-term planning. And that hasn't happened because and of the government's paralysis. Theresa, I mean, a failure of long-term planning, 
Brexit holding up uh, the white paper, holding up any legislation to sort out these sorts of problems and also add into that the fact that London particularly is very reliant on European workers to Absolutely. do these vitally important care jobs. Well, I, I would acknowledge we need to get that green paper out. It, this is an issue that successive governments have found incredibly difficult to deal with, but it is vital that we find a solution. We try and build a cross-party consensus. And, of course, any changes to the immigration system that might come after we leave the European Union have to ensure that the social set care sector can still it's recruit the people okay. it needs. It's not there now and you're talking right. about no deal we are, and the end we of freedom of movement. very much staying with healthcare uh, now and uh, doctors in London are warning there's a crisis over a shortage of GPs and if there isn't, if that problem isn't addressed soon, it'll break the NHS as we know it. The capital has had the highest number of practice closures compared to other regions of the UK which means Londoners are having to wait longer to get appointments with GPs. Bhavani Vadi reports. This is a campaign to stop the closure of Cricklewood Health Centre, which serves 5,500 patients. It's in northwest London, which already has the lowest rate of GPs per head of population in the country. Anne Clark and her family have been patients here for nine years, and she's a local councillor. This wider area is continuing to grow. We have the Brent Cross Regeneration Scheme is adding 7,500 new flats. We're talking about an awful lot of new people here um, in an area where we are really already under doctored. So to close one, it doesn't make any sense at all. Sue Waller has long-term health issues and is registered at another nearby surgery. This is the online booking system that I can use to make appointments with my uh, general practice. And this shows that the first available appointment is on the 4th of July. That's around about a month away. And if this surgery were to close, I I'm just really worried that it will be much, much longer. And Dr Nicholas Routledge is the medical director of the surgery. The list has increased in size over the last three years, um, virtually doubling. The idea that there's spare GK capacity around here is not accurate. Um, I think there would be an impact on the local hospital, the Royal Free Hospital, which I don't think wants another large number of patients attending for things that could be dealt in, in primary care. The pressure on GPs across London has worsened, with the numbers of doctors per person in the capital falling over the last few years. 118 GP practices have closed in London since 2013, affecting around 345,000 patients in that time, according to figures released under Freedom of Information requests. Our analysis of the data obtained by the medical website Pulse shows that between 2018 and 2014, London had the highest number of closures of GP surgeries compared to all other regions in the UK. So it's not surprising there's so many practice closures in London. There's a lot of uh, older GPs who are running their practices single-handed um, and when they're retiring, unfortunately, they're just not able to find people to take their place anymore. We also realise that there's quite a, there's a high number of practice closures in areas with higher deprivation and there are obviously quite a few areas in London with higher deprivation. Doctors' representatives say GPs can see up to 60 patients a day and want better core funding as well as measures to address their workload to improve recruitment. The body that represents GPs in London has a stark warning if this issue is not addressed. So in the capital at the moment we've got a crisis with the number of practices closing. The knock-on effect of that is that if people can't get in to see their GP, that puts more pressure on our secondary care colleagues at a time when the hospitals are already struggling. So essentially, if this isn't addressed, you could see that it will break the NHS as we know it. I mean, that's kind of drastic assessment, isn't it? I think we're actually at drastic times with this, and I don't think that we should be uh, light on the language that we use, really. Um, this is a crisis. We've got an increase in population size. I mean, it's not going to be long before London goes over the 10 million mark. We've got a decrease in number of GPs. In a statement, NHS England said, thousands of practices continue to be helped through the GP resilience programme, where investment has increased from a planned £8 million to £13 million, and that the highest number of doctors in NHS history are training to be GPs. But that may be of little comfort to patients like these who fear having to wait even longer to see their doctor if this surgery was to close. Well, Dr Onka Sahota is still with us, a practising GP in London, as we said. So does this ring true to you? 
Absolutely. Uh, we have great difficulty in finding doctors who want to become partners. And if you're lucky, uh, to, you might take, take uh, up to 18 to 24 months to get a partner. We have great difficulty in recruiting GPs to be regular doctors. What patients want is continuous of care, that they want to see the same doctor repeatedly so they have their history and can give them the care they need. But we have difficulty in recruiting doctors who want to be partners and sell you doctors. Now, a lot of lay people sitting at home will be thinking, well, why on earth is that the case? Because generally speaking, we think of GPs as being relatively well paid. Um, it's you know, some would argue less stressful than being a hospital doctor, better hours. Uh, most GPs don't have to do on call anymore unless they want to. So why is that recruitment so difficult? Well, let's not forget that, that the GPs are private uh, contractors in the NHS. So the GP partners are, don't get a salary, they're getting a profit of their practice. So essentially they're sort of bit small, small business people. Small, small yeah. business people. And so what's happened over this time is that the funding per, per patient has gone down for, for GPs. We having The salaries have gone up, the costs of, of, of premises and, and, and utilities have gone up, so the profitability has gone down. And also doctors want a life work-life balance also. They want to have the children to spend time with the children. They want to be able to look after people. And increasingly we talk about social care, right? All patients are having increasing amount of social problems and they can't get and the care they need and it all it's comes all up with the only front line for the patient is the GP. D Theresa Villiers, your government promised 5,000 new GPs it's not by 2020 it's not happening is it it's not going to happen well as um, you reported in in your package earlier on there are more doctors in training than ever before so there's a significant it takes eight expansion years to train a doctor and it? the NHS long-term plan has put GP practice and primary care right at the heart of it including four and a half billion in the commitment from the government's overall pledge to 20 billion more funding for the NHS so the plans are there but we I completely as, agree we need as, to as, see them deliver as, more GPs just, in Just London. as Neil. with the support for Boris, I think Theresa is in denial about the level of the problem and, 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 and you know, it's we're at break, but in Southwark there were 41 GP practices and 14 have vacancies. My own uh, GP has been put into special measures by the Care Quality Commission. Patients are losing out, older people, disabled people, both through care service retraction and through uh, a failure to, to support and resource the NHS to the level it needs. These are fundamental problems and Onka is absolutely right. Brexit has frozen this government and they are neglecting other issues, be it policing and knife crime, the NHS and social care. There are so many other problems that we genuinely need to, to, to face and in Instead of dealing with them, they're but, uh, obsessively the ideological heard about Brexit. The, the, the government has put more, more money into the NHS. We have a five-year plan now. We have more doctors in training. I mean, what well, else do you want so, to do? So, the, the, and our manifesto had, had some of the policies on this. But looking at, uh, if it's about training, look at the fees students are facing going to university. Look at the maintenance costs that, that, that they're facing. Actually tackling some of those issues. Key worker status should be a priority because doctors uh, you know, also need places to live. And we do not have a government that's living any Anywhere near the kind of more affordable house building we this need. Is, this is a sector which is already £35 billion underfunded, right? Put that amount of money in isn't sufficient, right? It's a service which is underfunded. And if you need, say, £30 million and you put another £5 billion into it, it isn't good enough, right? If you don't <coughs> fund the service adequately, any amount of funding will not be sufficient. And secondly, I think the, uh, the reality is that 10 years ago okay. we had... I'm afraid, I'm very sorry everybody, you were in full flow and I, I apologise, uh, but we are going to have to leave it there. That is it for now, my thanks to Onka and of course to Teresa and to Neil, thank you for watching. I do hope you can join us again next week, goodbye and have a good Sunday afternoon, bye bye. What